I'm Arno from ThinkCell, and uh, we're going to, to be talking about the practical approach to error handling. Um, we are, well, we are ThinkCell, we make a PowerPoint add-in, but it's not, it's of course a very cool PowerPoint add-in. We reverse engineer PowerPoint and we have complicated algorithms in there. And, uh, and we also had to address this problem. And this is basically the gist of the talk is our experience of how we, we handle errors. Now, of course, uh, errors can happen anywhere, unfortunately. Uh, and everyone wants a very reliable program. And we absolutely have no time to write error handlers. So given that, the question is, what do we do? Before we address this, um, let's look at just some basics. You know, where do these errors come about? What are we actually talking about? So let's say you have a file uh, that's being opened and we have a file object. And what happens if the file doesn't exist? So first of all, how do you know that? Uh, one easy way would be that your open function has some return value. Um, of course, that doesn't work for constructors. For constructors, you, have, you could have some out parameter, which is really ugly. And it also clutters the code with all kinds of checks. And at least now in the later C++ versions, you can put no discard for the return values so you don't forget to check. But it's still all not great. Um, one thing that's, that's kind of nice when you we're dealing with errors, uh, which is maybe not used so often, um, are, are status flags. If um, it, it essentially you, you just set a bit on the first failure and just carry on your operations as if nothing happened, and only at the end you check whether everything went right or not. And this is actually very common if you're dealing with graphics cards, when you're issuing graphics commands. There you usually just issue all the graphics commands, and only at the end you find out whether it worked or not. And that's, of course, fine if you're doing, um, if, if, if failure doesn't, doesn't cause any, any problems while you're while you issuing your, com your commands, while you're running your code. Um, so for writing a file, it's probably just fine. Um, for reading a file where you need the results, it's probably not. Um, it's actually the default for the not so much beloved C++ I.O. streams, which are kind of going out of fashion. Um, one other way to deal with errors, which is more modern, uh, are monads. Um, the goal here is to, again, have the same code path for success and error. And we, it's, it's a little bit like a SID variant, where you have either some success, some success result or you have some error code, and plus some utilities to, to basically pass these things through your code. And um, there's probably something like that, what we are going to get for C++23. There is a, uh, the 323 proposal making its way through the standard committee. It's now at release 11, last time I checked. So it's actively being worked on, and then probably, hopefully, it's going to get finalized, and, and then we'll, we'll get it expected. And of course, there are exceptions, right? That's the standard way how we report errors. Um, a few things about exceptions that probably all of you know. Uh, always catch them by, by, by reference. Otherwise, you get slicing. And when you get slicing, then also the object gets at least partially copied. And um, or if you if you just catch the object, you don't get any slicing. That's also good, but you still get copied. And if the copying throws an exception itself, then you'll just terminate the program. Um, an interesting thing is so so you want to do this always by reference, right there. Uh, an interesting thing is the throw at the very end, and um, it's always throwing the original object. Um, it's no matter what you're catching up there. If you just write throw semicolon, it's the original object that's being rethrown. OK, um, well, what's the problem with exceptions? If I'd be a little bit mean, I'd say they work a little bit like a multi-level return go-to, because they add these invisible code paths to your code. Wherever an exception is thrown, you're, you're, you, you have another code path. And that's a reason that some, co some uh, code bases don't like exceptions, because they generate all these code paths. So you could basically say, well, here we have, we have two functions. Um, and, and every time they throw, um, it's a little bit like a, like a go-to. So here, they th here are the, uh, the, the two lines that actually throw. Um, and, 
And if you kind of split this out as a go-to, you'd be, you could be kind of mean and say, well, it's a little bit like I have this, this side channel where I can leave my function and I'll just set that value of the side channel and then, and then exit somehow. And in a similar way, when you, when you receive that exception, it's also you are, you're kind of leaving your control path and you're, you're jumping into the catch code. Um, so that's, that's not so nice that you have all these code paths. Now, of course, you'd say, well, stop whining. We have to write exception safe code, right? Hmm. Um, first of all, we have to say, what's, what's exception safe code? And uh, we already, well, it was already mentioned in the keynote. Uh, there are these exception safety guarantees. And the best one you can have, and, and they're not really specific to exceptions. You have them with anything that can fail and, or doesn't fail. The best possible option is that it doesn't fail. It never fails. That's nice, um, but not always possible. The next one is the strong exception guarantee, um, which is when the function fails, then it either will restore the state that function had before it was called, or it will succeed. And that's really nice and desirable in library code, and it's also doable in li library code. We should write libraries like that. In application code, it's really hard because usually you have many state changes, one after the other, and to batch them all up and to roll them back as soon as something goes wrong is just takes, takes a lot of effort and, and you potentially, you, you will hurt performance and it's not something you will do in practice. Something easier, which may be achievable, is the basic exception guarantee. So you will restore the program just to some valid state, not to the state it was before the function call, but just to something valid. Hmm. So let's say we have this, uh, this customer calling, is this Microsoft Word support, is writing a book, suddenly Word deleted everything. I was like, oh, that's okay, or oh, Word is only providing the basic exception guarantee. It's like, oh, thank you very much. Then, then you, you helped me a great deal. Uh, yeah, then that's, that's, that's fine. Thank you and have a good day. Well, it's unlikely to happen, right? It doesn't even guarantee basic guarantee. <laughs> it's going to crash. <laughs> um, well, maybe it does. Maybe it does. It just deletes everything. And it's fine. It's because basic exception guarantee, right? <laughs> it's, a, it's a valid state, empty, empty document. So here's the challenge. Error handling is a lot of effort. First of all, in development, we have to be very paranoid. We have to check. Everything can fail. So we have to look. And, and, and be aware of what can fail. And we have to create all the error handling code for all these things that can potentially fail. And then once we created all that code, that is running very rarely because things go wrong very rarely, then in testing, we have all these code paths. And then we have to test all these code paths. We have to have test coverage. So we test and code and test. And we know that if we don't test them, then they don't work. And we do all that, and it's, it's very tedious. And the customer says, so what? Because at the end, we have to solve a customer problem. The customer doesn't pay us for writing error handling code. The customer pays us to get stuff done, um, and not to fail, like, gracefully, even gracefully. So the question remains, what do we do? And we had that question at the very beginning of Think so, and uh, and yeah, we had to make a decision. What are we going to do, right? And here's what we did. So first of all, you have to make sure that your program doesn't silently n do stuff that it's not supposed to do, that it doesn't have any, 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 it doesn't go wrong anywhere where you won't notice. So you have to make sure that you check everything. So we have a bunch of macros that basically, depending on what kind of call we are making, whether we have a Windows to the Windows API or, or COM or in Unix, we have various these macros that we wrap around these, these functions uh, that just check whether these things succeeded. Uh, we add asserts galore, like, and they stay in release. So we make sure that the program stays on that path of correctness. And we also write all the functions which are not supposed to throw exceptions are being marked no except. That means that, yes, they will terminate the program when they actually have an ex exception, but 
an unexpected exception is not being, not being expected and it's probably going to terminate the program anyway. So we just say rest terminate right here. We install a handler that makes sure that when you, when you get the, 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 this, this termination, that yet then you, we know about it, that we get some sort of diagnostics and say, well, there was an unexpected termination here. We do all this checking and it's, it's really thorough. And then what do we do when something goes wrong? Nothing. We just assume that everything works. Of course, not always. Yeah, go ahead. Do you, uh, you say you assert aggressively. Do you assert the, the return values of, with API calls and things like that? Or do you assert? We assert internal logic of the program, anything that people think is worth asserting, like preconditions, postconditions, internal logic, um, that sort of thing. But that's different from getting the result of, a, of an external function call. Not re in our mind, not really. Okay. That's my point here. It's still, we just assume that the program is in the correct state when all these things say, OK, I succeeded. That's defined behavior. This is when the program works. Do you make um, differentiations between should not happen errors, like programmer oh. errors, and runtime stuff when you are trying to load the corrupt file? OK, so, so there was the question um, whether we make a distinction between certs and API calls, first of all, uh, to repeat the question. Uh, and we don't make that distinction. So we treat basically a, a f API calls that are supposed to never fail in the same way as assertions. They are just things that are assumed to succeed. But predictable failures like the file doesn't I'll, exist. I'll get, I'll get to that. <laughs> OK. Um, now, you asked um, whether there is a distinction between? Uh, between these two things, like programmer errors, should not happen errors, and Right. So, errors. so right now, but we basically wrote the things. program as if everything works, OK? Now, this won't, we, we won't be able to do this all the way to the end, but we can do it that far. We can, we can do it most of the time. Now, the goal is, if you can do that, then the, the set of code paths you have to support is really small. Everything always works. So you just support this one single code path that says everything works. And, and the same, the, the set of program states is really small because things are always correct. You have correct state in your program. Everything is fine. Now, of course, what do you do if these checks fail? And they will fail. Now, if the check fails, first of all, if it's happening on the, you, you collect as much information as you can. You try to understand why the check failed. So, for example, when you're on the client, we send a report with a mini dump home, with a, with a memory dump. Send it to a server for analysis. Uh, when you are on the server, we stop the thread. We just halt and, and call the operator. Say, hey, you have something to debug here. And then they can attach to the server and they have the best debugging environment possible because they have the actual broken machine in front of them. That's priority number one. Priority number two is you carry on somehow. So you, if the check was critical, then the program behavior is now undefined. You basically cannot make any claim anymore that your program is correct because you did not program it for the case that the check fails. One important thing is when assertions fail, do not terminate. Keep going. Programmers are supposed to write aggressive assertions. If you terminate the program when an assertion fails, programmers will refrain from writing ex aggressive <laughs> assertions because they will get screamed at by the boss because they actually they, they, they crashed the customer machine. So don't do that. We have to carry on when an assertion fails. And this lets people write, without any penalty, write really aggressive assertions so that we actually we want to, we want to tickle the, the, the correctness out of the program. We want to know, are these things really true? Are we, are we really on the correct path? Of course, if you need safety, um, you have to add this at another level. So that's always like, okay, when an assertion fails, um, can I carry on? Or may things just go wrong and the things, you know, things break and then the, the nuclear power plant explodes? Well, 
If you need that, you have to add it in another level. What our server, for example, does is it has several categories of requests. And every time when, when one of these threads, when, when a check fails, then that thread will stop or it will go on into an infinite loop, which is, I mean, it may not actually violate a, 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 uh, violate a check. It may just go into an infinite loop for some other reason. The effect is the same. That request will not get processed and the thread won't return. And in that case, we just count the number of threads which are which are um, handling a particular type of request. And when that goes up above a certain limit, we'll just stop handling that request altogether, hoping that the other requests are, are have less bugs and, and we'll continue, continue to serve them. You have different kinds of assertions, the ones where you continue on. Do you have some that say, oh, this really is critical? So we, we, we do in, but, but the, so the, the, the default ones, the default one that, that the people are supposed to use are the ones that carry on. Okay. So for the ones that carry on, do you always have to special case and figure out how do I carry on? Or sometimes is it just, oh, this assertion failed and I'll just keep doing what I was doing? I, I just keep doing. And if it, if it crashes afterwards, I mean, the program the behavior from that point onward, oh, sorry. So I have to repeat the question. You, you asked, uh, no, so, so first continue. of all, Oh. Are, there, are, there different kinds of are there different kinds of assertions? So are there different kinds of assertions? Yes, but, but, but we, our, our guidance is that basically use a default, the default assertion which will carry on. And I will get to the different various levels of assertions that we have later on. So then you ask the question. For the ones that carry on, uh, do, you, do you have to special case that or do you just you know, let the assertion fail and then continue? What do we do if an assertion fails? How do we carry on? Well, we just continue the program. There's no, there's no extra code. Actually, there is, a special, there is a special rule, which is you, will you are not supposed to write any code that is for handling or you are not even supposed to think about what happens when these checks fail. So, when, so, so that's kind of the, 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 the thought that, that people should have in their head. It's black and white. Either it's supported or it's not. And if it's not supported, then, it's, then it's, it's black and you're not supposed to write a single line of code that is basically supporting that case. Okay, uh, I, I think, well, I don't know, there <laughs> first. So from what you just said and your characterization of aggressive assertions, <clears throat> they just sound like a substitute for actually understanding code. Um, so is, is my, are, my, are, my, are my aggressive assertions a substitute for understanding the code? Um, well, hopefully not, but they can be enormously helpful to validate that you were right. So we are, have assertions in the code and where we then afterwards look in the bug receiver, did this thing actually ever trigger? And so kind of prove the, the point. It's like I, I, when someone's looking at it and say, I think this should, the, the, like, like I, I am free to say I have a strongest opinion on that piece of code. So I'm just going to put an assertion in there and that assertion will not hurt because I know it will not, it will, it will not terminate the program. So I will let this go run out there on 500,000 machines and then I can check later on if it ever fails. And if it never failed, that would actually, you know, prove my point. It would probably violate my, uh, probably, probably validate my assumption. And we do use it for that purpose. I think you answered my question. You, okay. you collect all the information. All we do, questions. yes, we do collect everything. So, um, um, are, they, are the assertions costly at runtime? There are some in the, in the inter where, I mean, it, it's found by profiling. Only the ones that are found to be bad by profiling will be switched off. And there are some which are then turned into debug only assertions. Yes, these cases do occur. Um, but it's, it's supposed to be validated by profiling. So that the, you just don't do it by default. Again, clear, simple guidance to the developers. Just write an assertion. Don't worry about it. And, and don't worry about the case. If you, are, if you are wrong in your assertion, also don't worry about that. OK. Um, so what's next? The next is we have to go home and do homework. We have to reproduce the error. And of course, I said we are not going to handle any of these checks. We just put in the checks, and we, then we assume everything works. If you can essentially, during your testing, already reproduce that these checks fail, I mean, the file is not there, then you have to handle that case. That's, that's clear. Um, so if you, if you but, but we, are, we are adamant that you are you're first reproducing the error before writing any, any handling code. 
if you, you write handling code for errors that are not reproducible, then these error handlers are either never used because they are not actually you know, occurring in the wild, um, or, and, and they are never tested because you cannot, you, know, you cannot realistically trigger this error. So you don't really know whether your error handler works. Maybe it looks good, but you know, who knows in which state that machine is when that error actually triggers, whether you are still actually able to execute your error handler or something else is wrong in the, in the, program, in the, in the system. So does that mean that you don't write tests that uh, synthetically inject any of these errors for reproduction and testing? Like you only exercise them in the live setting? No. Uh, so so are, we, are we actually running tests that would exercise these errors? Yes, we do. I mean, if there are things which are clearly cases where the error occurs, then, then of course we try them out. I mean, what happens if, if the, the file's not there? What happens if, you know, wh whatever. You, 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 you do exercise as many of these scenarios as possible. But, but, they, but they are supposed to be, you know, realistic scenarios. You have to be able to get into them. Um, and so, for example, um, you, you know, any of these API errors, they are all documented to fail in some way. And, and things like the, the, the graphics card can't process requests. It, it may be so rare that you will, you'll, you'll never get it to that state. And then we, we, we don't write handling code for it. We just put in the check and if it never fails, it's fine. It's, it's, it's okay. Um, it also focuses your, your effort onto the error handlers, which actually do occur. So if you, otherwise you spread your effort thin. You're, you're, you're doing all kinds of, you sprinkle all kinds of error handling code here and there but you're missing the big ones. Um, do you write the, these error test cases, do you write them only after it's happened in the field or are some of them written they, in advance? I, do, do we only trigger errors that are happening in the field? No, when you, are, when you are actually writing your code, I mean, you do think about cases which are which are realistic. I mean, you know, pull the network network cable out of the computer, uh, shut the computer, like like like, give, let the computer go to sleep. These kind of things. I mean, we do test them out. It's not like it doesn't. It's not as radical, maybe, as it sounds. Um, but but still, you would like to have a reproduction, and 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 that's you don't just go by error by 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 error name. If like some error occurs, and it's like, uh, yeah, okay, it could be. Well, they just blindly put in some error handling code. Well, we don't go by the document. Right. 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 We don't look at the documented error cases and handle them all. That's that's not the approach. But we are actually looking at what can we trigger, what is either happening in the field or during testing. If an assert fails and you don't crash, doesn't that open you to the worst possibility of corrupting data? Does the if if an assert fails and you don't crash, does that open up the possibility of corrupting data? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Clearly. Uh, but I think the, the, the alternative is worse, which is let, like, pen, like penalize people for, for writing asserts. I, I, I'm convinced that it's, it's, I mean, we have, we have persistent data. We have a data, we have a, a, a file, file format that we save to disk and, and reload. It is very rare that we get the, the, like actual corruption there. It does happen, but then we have to basically put in compatibility code to sort out the mess afterwards. Um, but I, I'm convinced that the, 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 the downside of, of, of terminating immediately would, would, be, would, would basically make people not write assertions as aggressively as they would now. And, and I think aggressive assertions is, is what you want because you, this makes you learn about the program. This makes you like, discover the unknown unknowns, that the things that you, you didn't know would ever happen. Uh, yeah, I think what you're describing like sounds pretty radical at first, but given that most people turn off asserts in production, that has the same effect of continuing after an assertion. I think I think what I'm what I okay. So so is it, it, it? You said it sounds pretty radical, but doesn't the the effect of turning off assertions in release mode has the same effect? Yes, I think what I'm what I'm what I'm saying here is. I'm, I'm just putting things in a, in a very clear, you know, very clear guidelines 
Um, it's a very black and white thinking. And th th that's, I think, the, the, it, maybe it's more a difference in thinking than an actual difference in, in doing, uh, potentially. But at least you, you are, you're, not low, you're no longer feeling bad if you just ignore an error. It's okay. It's, if this error doesn't occur, you don't handle it. That, that's the policy. Um, here, here it is. So 5% of errors handle 95, 5% uh, of the handlers handle 95% of the errors. The, 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 the goal here is write high quality error handlers when these errors occur. Um, there is an example. There, there was um, a, the, 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 um, our XML persistence used the, uh, some Microsoft library and it, it failed on some machines and we could have just put up an error message. But we found out that actually all that was wrong is we need to re-register this component in the registry. So we could actually do this automatically. So what we did is when, whenever you created one of these, these XML processes, uh, it, you check whether that worked. And if it didn't work, and, and you, we, we checked that that's the error that, that we expected would, would, would throw, um, then we just registered in the registry and tried again. And, and so we had that no fail guarantee suddenly um, for that function because we fixed that bug by just re-registering the component in the registry. And that's, I think, that, that's, that, that's important. We, it, you need to focus on finding ways to fix the problem. And then just you have a no, no fail guarantee. And that, that's, that's, that's very nice. Um, we also ignore uh, out of memory errors. Um, and, and then that's already, um, Dave Abrams already said that, that in, in Swift, it's the same policy. Um, and, and of course, that's true on all modern machines. You have, you know, you have lots of virtual memory, and, and once you are, you know, out of virtual memory, I mean, you're really <laughs> there's not a whole lot you can do about it. Okay, um, I want to go through now the categories of errors, different categories of errors that we actually support, um, which have been which have evolved over time. So this is kind of like the learning we had over time. What kind of categories of errors are there that we are interested in, and how should we handle them? Um, the, the first one is the, is the simple one. That's the, the critical error. Uh, things like null pointer access. Um, if, if you do an API call that's not expected to fail, um, that's probably also a critical error. Um, it is also a critical error in our case if it fails, but in a, with a different error code than we expect. Um, and of course, failed, failed assertions. So. They are all, they're basically, uh, so, so first of all, they are in the category of never happens. You don't write any code for things which are critical errors in your code. If you say this is a critical error, you just assume it works. You don't write a single line of code that, that accommodates, oh, what if that actually fails? Maybe I could do a little bit of error handling. No, don't do any error handling in that case. Um, and, and it's, it's a little bit like C++ undefined behavior. The program behavior is undefined afterwards. You don't make any assumptions about the code. That in particular means that we stop, uh, we stop any future reports. So we send an error report, say we went into a critical situation, and then we stop error reporting. Otherwise, you would get follow-up errors that just confuse the, the programmer, essentially, and we're looking at, looking at these errors. Um, I already said the server goes into an infinite loop. And... Um, do you tell the user when something like that happens? We only do that if a false alarm is unlikely. So what are, where is the false alarm unlikely? API calls that fail? You probably did this API call for a reason. So probably now if that fails, things will go down the drain. Um, if the API call is, is, supposed, is, is expected to fail, but with a different error code, then we say, hmm, Maybe it's going to work. Maybe it's going to be OK. Maybe the same error handler that we did for this er other error code is also going to work for this error code. And we will, are going to execute the error handler. So let's, let's carry on and hope for the best. And don't tell the user. Same with, with assertions. It, go ahead. So how the, on the server side, how does entering an infinite loop scale? So is there a backup instance or what's going on there? The, the, so um, shutting down the whole system. So that's, that, that was the, the story. Of, so how does it scale when you go in an infinite loop? That's the response for servers. So you notify the, uh, the operator, and you go into an infinite loop and wait for a debugger to be attached. Um, how does that scale? Well, it does scale um, because, of course, not all threads are going to hang, hopefully, unless you really messed up and all threads hang. <laughs> um, but then hope, so hopefully that's then restricted to a, to a particular type of request. So 
people, I don't know, can't check prices anymore, something like that. And, and then we are, we are going to stop these kind of requests. We're not going to take them anymore once we've reached the limit of threats, but we'll still keep use, like serving other requests. So the, the server is likely going to, going to carry on. Um, and then, but most of the time, it's just a single threat that's hanging. It's, it's just some, some unexpected situation that happened um, and, and someone did something funky, I don't know, copy-pasted non-UTF-8 non characters into, into like an edit box or whatever, you know, something that, that's kind of unexpected. And then this thread is hanging and then you have time in the morning and go and attach to the, attach to the, the server and, and see what's going wrong. So that's the typical case. There was, there was another question. Um, if, if, not, if we, if, yeah, go ahead. If not, why, why tell them? Is, um, it, of, is it it's our fault or it's your fault? Okay. Yeah, so, so wh why, um, the question is, why do we tell a user about the error at all if he can, if he can do nothing about it? Um, the main reason to tell the user about the error is you may want a reproduction from him. That, that would be, if, if, the crash, if the crash happens, maybe he knows what he did to make that crash happen. Um, if you're going to crash likely anyway afterwards, you may as well tell him, stop, you know, wait for a second. Now, think about what you've done last. Unfortunately, we're going to crash now. Um, but uh, that's, uh, yeah, sorry, sorry. You might also call us. Right, so, so he may know what's, what's wrong. So he may, he may think, okay, it's ThinkCell. I mean, we're running inside PowerPoint, so it could be Microsoft that's wrong or it could be us that's wrong. And then they may like, you know, dial the support hotline faster. And, and of course, we tell them. Um, we also ask them to send an error report. If, if they have um, reports disabled, which they can, automatic reports, they may still send us uh, reports by email. And they have the opportunity to do that in that error dialogue. So that, that's kind of the purpose of, of telling the user um, that something went wrong. Um, OK, so that one gets categorized as an error. Um, but there are more. Um, let's say you have you know, register foo as a, as a function, and we're hooking that function. And um, we, so we have this register foo hook that calls the original function. And then if that function succeeded, then we are keeping track of that registered foo somehow. Um, now, let's say that during testing, we were never able to see any case in practice where, say, PowerPoint is calling this thing and where they called it in a way that it would fail. We've never seen that. It, we, we, we have kind of have the option here to say, well, I mean, this is something we... Um, we, we expect to succeed all the time. This may not be realistic if that register foo may also be called by third-party add-ins. I mean, then you could say, hmm, it, it's, it's very, it, it would be trivial to come up with a forced, uh, with, with, a, with, with, a, with, a, with an imagined add-in that would actually trigger this error just by making that API call and sticking in wrong parameters, for example. So there, there's a trivial, trivial reproduction. But still, um, in, in practice, that reproduction may not ever occur. It may not happen. We haven't seen it yet. And if that happens, the program may no longer be in a very good state. So it, it may have consequences we, we, that we don't know because we've never observed that kind of behavior. And that's, that's these, this category of errors untested. Um, so we had no reproduction, and the question is, is, is the rest of the program then still OK? Does that tell us anything about the state of the rest of the program? Now, in that case, uh, we actually also send a report. Um, we don't stop sending reports because, I mean, by the letter, we are still in a defined state. Uh, everything is still OK. We, we you know, returned the, the error condition uh, to the caller, and, and we didn't register a foo because the red foo was, was not registered by the original function, so because it failed. So uh, we are still good. Um, we still watch out that we throttle reports in that case because we don't want it to happen that these things, you know, get triggered over and over again because you have or you are in some special, special situation where that happens. And, uh, and then, you know, the, the, the client is just busy sending our reports all the time. So after like 10 error reports, we say, hey, like, calm down. We're just going to ignore some of them now um, because this is, this is not, you know, we, 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 can't, we can't take that hit, that this performance hit anymore. Um, 
Now, if you're on debug, um, of course, you can notify the developer, right? Very easy, because suddenly you have a reproduction for something that you didn't have a reproduction for before. Um, so it's, 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 it's just perfect. You just tell the developer, hey, you can just now take the, take the notify out, um, take that error out, make a defined behavior, and you now have a test case uh, how you can actually test this behavior. Uh, server, same thing, you, you send a report. Um, there's another category of error, which is bad user experience. Um, so let's say we, there's a, some, some bug in Microsoft PowerPoint, of which there are many. Um, and sometimes PowerPoint makes shapes disappear, which it does. Um, and it's, we, know it's, we know that this occurs. It's reproducible. It's, it's, it's per, by us, it's supported. We, we just drop the shape and say, hmm, OK, PowerPoint messed it up. What can we do about it? It has been tested that we are, our response is actually appropriate. It's fine. But it's not nice. And the user may call and say, hey, my shape just disappeared. Um, and then you want to be able to say something. You, you may, if you, if you want to do it in a very elaborate way, you, you may you know, put up an, a message and make it like a, a nice user interface and, and tell them what happened. That's not always necessary um, if it happens rarely. Alternatively, you can just log. You can just write something into the log file and say, you ran into this particular situation. So when he picks up the, she or she picks up the phone and says, my shape disappeared, you can tell her, you know what? I, I, I can see from your log file that you ran into the situation. And we filed this at Microsoft under this bug number. And if you want, you can call them up and say, hey, just get your act together and, uh, and fix it. Um, here's another one. Um, sometimes the, the, the system is in a funky state. You can put it into that state and you, you can reproduce it, but it's still unusual and the system may react differently from what it otherwise would do. For example, um, you can, I think in Windows, you can put the space as the default decimal separator. So it would print like 10 space zero for 10 co comma or, or decimal zero. Um, it's fully supported by ThingSell. We've tried it out. It works. But maybe other parts of the program, maybe other parts of the program are not as robust and or third party tools are not as robust. So in that case, um, yeah, it could be cause of the problem. And uh, what we then do is at least when we're having running a remote support session. So then someone called and, hey, the, I have a problem with my computer and something doesn't work. And, and the, the, the support engineer just does a remote session, runs it, on, on, looks at the problem on the customer machine. Then we set a trigger, we set a flag. Um, and in that case, these things pop up and say, hey, you have a machine that is, that is strange. And, and you should probably, since someone reported a problem with that machine, you probably want to know that this machine is strange. Is a Turkish eye problem like that? <laughs> the, the, there, is there a Turkish eye problem like that? Yeah, so that's, that would be, you know, some of these things in that direction, the Turkish eye problem. Related question, do you see errors resulting from malicious users doing DLL injection or otherwise pirated software or stuff like that? Do I, it, the question is, do we see um, things like, like going wrong because of malicious users? Yes, we have seen uh, effects of viruses. Um, it's, it's much less common than things like virus scanners that mess things up, they, they, that, that, are, that are poorly programmed. <laughs> They're very, very common. Uh, also, very, very, very beloved are DRM tools, like digital rights management, that try to lock the system down in, in, in some ways. I mean, there are, there are great war stories about like, how we battle these guys because you know, some of them just, when you, when you write a file to disk, they think it's a really good idea to encrypt it. Because it could be a PowerPoint file, right? I mean, someone is trying to escape with some PowerPoint data, so when they write a file to disk, you just encrypt that file. Except that if it's a temporary file written by ThinkCell, and then we can't write our own temporary files anymore, uh, or read them, read them back anymore, because some DRM tool just encrypted our, our temporary files. And... Um, and then they said, um, yeah, we're going to put in some, some switch that, that basically disables encryption um, of, because your, your files are, are all starting, the temporary files are all starting with TC. And I'm going to put in a, a switch that says all the files that start with TC are no longer getting encrypted. 
Exactly. Well, that's nice and good, but the problem is that our files are going, going to be sent to other customers which then don't have the flag enabled. You can have, for some customers, you have it enabled, but they, com they communicate with each other and they send files around. So I said, oh, that's great that you've done that. I just scrambled all the file names of temporary files. There's no way you can tell apart one our temporary file from other temporary <laughs> files. So I'm just going to you know, right. sabotage your, 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 um, your fix there. And, uh, and then the, the DRM vendor just bailed, didn't make a sale at the customers for the, for the customer. <laughs> that, was, that was it. Um, yes, yeah, so, so yes, we do see that. Um, uh, if, if files, we, we are very restrictive with, with, with access rights. So we always wrote files with, um, with, with append data write only. And of course, there was some guy who's some, some virus tool that wanted to know what we wrote. I said, oh, we're going we're gonna to rewind the file and read it again and then, and then check it. And then he, he apparently wrote it out again. Well, the, the problem with this whole thing was he couldn't rewind because we had opened it in append mode. So, so they just, they did something, they did something. They, so, so you looked at these machines and all the files we wrote were, were like the, the file content and the file content again. <laughs> they somehow managed to like duplicate the file content in every single file that we wrote. <laughs> it was like, ah. <laughs> all right. Um, so now what do we do uh, with all these reports that are being sent to, um, to our server? So. They are, they are these, the, the memory dumps uh, from the client computers, they are sent to the server automatically. Um, and if the user opted out of sending them automatically, they can still send an email that we prepare for them with basically the same data. Now we have an error database uh, where, and that's actually available already as a service um, by, by other, like by, by providers, um, where all these memory dumps, they get opened in a debugger. And of course, you have to sandbox them well so that they don't, you know, don't get malicious stuff in there. Um, so they get the memory dumps get opened in a debugger, and then the, the RS are automatically analyzed and categorized where they actually occur. And then they go into a database. Uh, and then the developers can look at that database um, and, and open, open the dumps, look at them in a debugger. And what's kind of nice is that you can mark them as a developer. You can mark them as fixed in a particular version. And uh, that will actually trigger automatic updates. So if someone runs uh, into an error and, and the database says this is error is fixed, we'll see whether we can, we can ship basically a new version, update his, his installation to a new version that doesn't have that error anymore. Um, and for email cases, we also can we, we send automatic emails, which is kind of magic. You know, they, they, people write emails like, oh, support, I've, this is crashing, and here's my mini dump information sent. Like, bing, bing. If you update to this, this version, the error is going to be gone. It's like, wow, you have to have a support department. That's kind of amazing. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, now I want to talk about something a, a little bit different, um, which is how do we analyze bugs? Um, it turns out that because of testing, internal testing, the bugs that we have on the customer machines are very often related to some environment problems. I mean, you're running inside of PowerPoint. In PowerPoint, there are, there are all kinds of add-ins in there, and, and, and they all mess about with the system. They all run one address space. So very frequently, we have problems that have, that have to do with the customer environment. Um, and the, the question that we asked is, well, can we somehow find out automatically which environment things are responsible for this kind of bug? Can we automate that? And the idea was, well, we have a module list in the memory dump. So we know which modules are being loaded. And it should be possible to correlate whatever modules are being loaded with the error, and then find out which modules are actually responsible. And since we are, because we are ThinkCell, we wanted to do this in a very rigorous way, in a very, very nice, statistically rigor rigorous way. And I'm, I'm going to describe how we're going to do that. So, so basically, you have an error report, a report database right, with all the reports in there. And some of these reports are going to have the particular bug you're currently looking at. And the other ones don't. They have some different problem. But we're going to treat this different problem as basically the background distribution of modules. And the ones that have this particular bug are the modules that are hopefully somehow specific to that bug. And the question is, which modules 
are responsible, which modules correlate the most. Um, so let's say we have this, this list of error reports, and the one here means that that particular report exhibits that problem that we are currently hunting, and the zero means background. It's, it's a, it, for us, it's a random sample of, of whatever is out there. So we have six occurrences of the problem, and we have 12 reports. Now, let's say we have this module distribution. We have two modules, um, and x means the module is present, and a minus means the module is not present in this particular report. And for module A, you have out of, in the ones that are having the problem, the module occurs three times out of six. And in the reports that don't have that problem, the module also occurs three times out of six. You would say, well, it's probably pretty unlikely that that module has anything to do with the problem. Now, maybe you have a module B where the numbers are a little bit better. You have one which is you know, more associated with the problem. You have four out of six versus two out of six. Um, so is module B responsible? So how can you decide that? Why? At which point would you say, well, this is, this is significant. This is, this is really, this is a good indication that, there is, that it's associated with the problem. So the way we do this um, is by using minimum description length. The idea is that if, you, if, if none of the modules have anything to do with the problem, if they all just appear randomly, then none of the modules are going to be a good predictor of that problem occurring. And then the most efficient way to represent the world is just to do the compression of that to describe this, this list of zero and ones with a single uh, with a single probability that the error occurs, because the modules don't have anything to do with it. Now, or alternatively, if you have module B and you have the hypothesis that module B may have something to do with the problem, you could say, well, the probability that the error occurs should be different for, for reports that contain that module and reports that don't contain that module. So there are basically two different probabilities that you're going to estimate. One with the module, one without the module. And this should compress significantly better if the module has something to do with the problem. So let's do this exercise. The compression we're going to use is a perfect arithmetic compression. With the Laplacian estimator, we're going to estimate th this probability. Um, and we assume that, that all the, the probabilities are equally likely. It's, it's a, it's a, it, the, the, the prior is, is flat. Zero to one, anything is, 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 is possible with equal probability. And we are now looking at the number of bits that are required um, to compress n bits where k of them are ones. And it so is that the number of bits you are required is the log of n plus one times n over k. And you just have to apply this formula to now to this problem. So, um, and, and, and this formula will actually become smaller if P is, if P is closer to zero or one. So for the, for the extremes of P, you're going to, you're going to have, have a smaller rep bit representation. So when you have 12 bits out of six, uh, you actually need 13.55 bits. So you could need more than the 12 original bits. Of course, it has to come from somewhere. Uh, every compression has to make some things longer in order to make other things shorter. So that's the case here. Um, the ex other extreme case, if you have 12 bits with no ones at all, then you have 3.7 bits. You can compress it to 3.7 bits. And now we are basically doing the test um, for module A and module B. So we've, if you we compress everything together, the null hypothesis, module A and module B have nothing to do with it, is 13.55 bits. If we make use of module A, first of all, we have to account for the choice of A over B. We have two modules to choose from, and we have to transmit that information. And the, the guy on the other end has to know, am I going to look at module A or am I going to look at module B? And that costs one bit. And then we compress all the reports with A. And that's three out of six. That's 7.1 bits. And without A, same number. And we end up at, no surprise, 15.26 bits, which is louder than 13.55. .55. So A has nothing to do with the problem. Now we can look at module B, and it turns out um, it's still not relevant. 
So 4 over 6 is 6.71 bits. 2 out of, uh, two out of 6 is also 6.71 bits. But if you still, if you add everything up, the one bit you have to add in addition um, is actually bringing it over the 13.55. And you have to take into account that one, that one extra bit there. Now, if you have a module C now that is even more prevalent in the, in the error, um, then suddenly it pays off. So in this case, we have actually three modules to, to choose from. So we're gonna, it cost, gonna cost more to choose module C over A and B, uh, 1.5 bits. And then, but then for compressing, you only need these 5.3. If you add it all up, it's less than the 13.55. So in this case, you would say it's a good explanation of the world to say module C is actually at fault. Um, the, the, this may seem a little bit like, you know, far-fetched. Why would you do the, all this effort? Um, well, the thing is, um, we, we basically generate a whole lot more hypotheses now. Not only for all the modules, but also for things like um, a, a certain version range of modules. So from that, from that module, that version onwards, from only up to this version, from this version to that version. And, and all these things are going to generate a whole lot more hypotheses. And this is going to make it very likely that some of these things are going to be true just by chance. That's why it's very important to make sure that you are taking you know, the, the number of bits for encoding the hypothesis into account in order to really say, well, this, this, this is significant. Um, that, that's, that's where this bookkeeping actually pays off. Yes, go Among ahead. Among your hypothesis set, do you include um, uh, like pairs or multiple modules that are interacting in some fashion? You know, if, if A and B together? Um, do we take into account any combinations of, of modules? No, we don't. Okay. Not for now. Um, it's, it's, relatively, it's, it's relatively rare that that, that has. Usually what you have is you have, a, you have a certain product and that product has, you know, 20 modules and they're all going to be in it, it, so they have to get the same score because they are all present in this particular situation. Um, so, but that's okay because they all belong to one product. And so you're saying, well, it, it's, it's probably that one. Um, and we actually calculate that score when, you, when you, um, the developer opens the database together with every, every report, um, or not with every report, but every category of report. Um, it'll actually get, the, the, the developer will get that score and, and will get the list of, you know, possible candidates of modules uh, with, with, you know, the version ranges. Um, so that's, that's something we provide. And yeah, I guess I was thinking more of the case where it's not one product with, you know, 20 modules, but two different unrelated products. Yeah, so, you know, so is it possible? Absolutely. So is it possible that there are two interacting products? Yes, it is. Uh, we just haven't extended that mechanism so far. Um, it's... It would generate even more hypotheses, of course. Okay, um, I want to very briefly at the end uh, talk about C++ contracts. Um, they are not in the standard yet. Um, they're supposed to be a new language feature, essentially an assert on steroids. Um, and, and you can, can make declarative preconditions, postconditions, put them into functions. Um, why aren't they in the standard? Well, I think essentially because of all the questions we discussed in the talk. Um, so when do you check the contract? You can do it on debug, in release, you can do it never. Um, what do you do if the, if the check fails? Are you going to terminate or carry on? Or you, you report, what, what do you report, to whom? Um, so all these things are many variables that, that are still you know, up, up to debate, um, which, which have to be kind of sorted out to, to make to, to make that, that feature, you know, worthwhile, so. How, how is this better than a library implementation of like a cert that can do this? Um, I think they want to put it into the, they, so why is that better than a function, uh, a, a library implementation? Um, I, I think the idea is that you have this, this basically in the syntax and, and also potentially accessible to static checking. Um, potentially also just for, for documentation, so that there, there, there was the idea, well, maybe we don't have to check all, them, all of them. Maybe we just do it for documentation. Um, but I, I think there are just you know, many people expecting different things 
from that functionality. That, that's, that's a problem. It's just this wide range of how people handle these kind of situations. And that's why it's, it's so difficult to come up with a cons consensus of, of how this feature is actually going to work. So, uh, all right. Uh, yeah, so it was removed and the discussion continues. Um, and that brings me to the end. Thank you very much. For, and uh, yes, that's the cheap plug we, we are recruiting. Um, and yeah, if there are any further questions, just go ahead. I think the question of uh, security breaches was uh, raised. And again, if, if you get uh, the wrong error code from API call uh, and it continues, so maybe uh, the program ignores something important. Is there, is there a possibility of a security breach? Um, yes, there, there is. And, and of course, there is, it's, it's always a trade-off. Always. And um, we do have a, the situation where um, we do have particular uh, um, reports and, and error level that's even higher, which actually will terminate. So things like when you have an out-of-bounds condition, where you're saying we are now accessing you know, un uninitialized memory. We know we are accessing uninitialized memory. Then we would we would terminate um, for security reasons. Um, they are just only a few. Only if we can actually prove that that's actually happening. Um, that that's the that's the restricting factor. And these are not many cases. Um, I mean, null pointer access is yeah. You're gonna die anyway, so you, you may as well die immediately. Um, uh, yeah. So so there are situations where we terminate. Um, there are just not very many. Um, and I, 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 think, I, I think the main goal is um, to, the, the, the focus is make finding bugs easy. How do you get high quality software? By finding the bugs. When the bug is, yeah, but that's, I mean, it's, it seems simple, but, the, but, but that's, it's not, it's not the, you don't get to the reliable software by terminating in the right places. You know, yes, that's, that's like the last resort, and you may hope that that does something. But if that hurts the primary objective of fixing the bug, finding the bug and fixing the bug, then you, you may want to reconsider. You may not want to do it. You may want to run the risk that things get corrupted, that, you know, things, maybe that there's a security hole somewhere. But you just made it, the focus is always make it easy on the developer to find the bug and make, make, him, make him write aggressive assertions and, 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 and then he can actually, you know, she can actually fix it. And if it's fixed, it's good. So, and, and, and focus on, on the, the ones that actually occur. That's the other thing. You know, don't, because otherwise it's just, a, it's, you're, you're wasting your time on, on things which, are, which, which just may not be relevant. Sebastian. But I mean, this is a domain specific decision we are making. I mean, in the end, the worst that can happen is a corrupt power slide. That's a risk. Yeah, right. So, what we are, the, of course, that's the, the, our decision is colored by the fact that the domain that we are actually living in. So, if um, if if you are corrupting a PowerPoint slide, that that's that that's not so terribly bad. Um, on the other hand, if you ha are in a situation where you don't want to live with these kind of consequences, um, then I think you really have to think about how you mitigate the effect of a terminated program. So if the if you know if 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 the developer has or if the if the user has, if there's a high impact of some wrong assertions fire, firing, and and, and, the, and and there are many assertions that we just fix by fixing the assertion, it's it's very common, um, and if you don't have a good mitigation, then then developers won't just won't write assertions anymore, and and, and they ha they have to be able to, so it's 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 a fine line, um, you you have to be yeah you have to accommodate people to be to 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 make mistakes basically so, so at the other extreme right in, in the medical field we assert truths and when those truths aren't good we stop the software immediately and let the hardware interrupts you know the hardware kick in and protect the patient so that's like the other extreme is you you know nothing if you've asserted you know nothing about your state because you have truths and those truths aren't true anymore and you just have to stop. Right. So in the, in the medical field, um, to repeat that, in the medical field, the decision is a very different one. You basically stop immediately um, treating the patient, which is absolutely, I mean, that, that's absolutely the right thing to do. Um, in this case, probably the, you know, the, 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 the consequence is not quite as bad. 
you would you you hopefully then have as a you know as a as a backup for these kind of situations you at least have a captive system you have a you have a machine where you can actually log to your heart's desire you can you can you know get into the, the best possible state to actually fix the problem to make finding the bug easy um, and, and that's then probably what you have to do and so that that in other ways fixing the problem is easy um, and and yeah. So because I mean, if you if you're bored every fifth time, then probably you know, no one's going to buy your product. But um, I forgot. <laughs> Sorry. I you, was maybe it's going to come back. What's your success rate in convincing your users to actually enable the automated memory dump engine? Because that seems like it could be really sensitive. Because you could yeah, that, that would be my question. <laughs> What's our, what's our, yeah, what's our, our success rate in convincing them that we, that we send automatic error reports? I think it's pretty high. Um, simply by, we at some point switched from setting the flag, but setting the tick mark by, by default, as a, not, not setting it, by setting it by default. And, <laughs> and, and I, mean, I mean, now, like, I think our it, 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 um, developers, I mean, we're now experiencing this also in, 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 in the company, you have a, a change of management, and, and, and the, and people, developers care a lot about privacy. Mm -hmm. And it's just, you know, everyone uses Signal and, and no one wants to use, you know, unsecure, uh, insecure messengers and stuff like that. Um, in, in the world out there, I mean, people just don't, <laughs> don't care. I mean, like, 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 like well, it's, it's, I'm, I'm uploading everything un unencrypted to Google, to Microsoft, to whatever. Your Whatever. users might individually not care about privacy, but the presumably all using this at work in places that probably have corporate policies saying don't send corporate data to random whoever. I mean, in the in the documentation of the software, we have a very clear description of what we are sending. So it, that's that it's, it's absolutely yeah, absolutely. So they, the so people customers. corporates. The question was, do corporates care about these these things? Well, yes, they do care to an extent. And we do have a very good documentation of what we are sending. But I don't think they care so much anymore. I mean, I even I mean, we just had this discussion. I mean, um, now even big corporations put their data unencrypted into the Microsoft Cloud, into the Google Cloud, into and, and probably, I mean, if, if Microsoft would like to learn something about its competitors, they probably just have to look at their, into their data center. I mean, it's right there, right? And if ever China breaks into this thing, they probably have access to, you know, the Fortune 500 data. Um, but I, 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 from what I see, just people don't care that much, which is, which is unfortunate, don't get me wrong. I mean, I think they should care, but they don't. They don't care as much as, I, as, as they should. And, and you can use their lack of care to write better software. <laughs> and, we, and we can use the lack of care to write better software. Right. Yes, uh, that's... Right. So that's pretty rare that we find something... Like, we don't send the heap, we just send the stack. Uh, right. Oh, I see. Okay. Yes. So, 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 that, so, so that's a good comment. So it, it, is, it is essentially, we, we looked at many, 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 many memory dumps. And essentially none of them contain any customer data. So um, what people are usually sending from their machines in terms of you know, uh, all the, all the uh, telemetry that they're sending to, to all kinds of providers, um, I think they're revealing a whole lot more than by sending the mini dumps because the mini dumps are only stack memory. And so we'll never actually see any text or anything in there. Um, when, it's, you, when you said memory dump, I thought you meant that's the not the whole core dump. So no, we're not sending the whole core dump because that, that would also be way too much memory. Uh, so we, we're only sending the mini dump, which interestingly, um, th there's no such thing on, on Mac, except that Sebastian uh, wrote now the mini dump facility for Mac. And I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's, is it? Is it it's, pop? it's in GitHub, yeah, okay. So uh, yeah, so that was basically, there was no equivalent of, of this mini dump and then opening the mini dump in, in a debugger, but now we also have it on Mac because we are running on both so platforms. Let's just hope that passwords don't fit into short string optimization. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's hope that passwords don't fit into long, uh, short passwords string optimization, yes. Powerpoint yeah. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so... They will, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> you said, um, I think, that Apple is Because you allow things to continue after a search fail, you have some code to that effectively makes contracts more lax after that or fixes things up. Or, this seems like throwing good money off the bat. N no, so, so what we do is... Um, so. The, the question is, what do we do after assertions fail? Um, we are essentially switching off any sort of reporting. 
um, because you, you, all the reporting you are getting, you are, your program is already in an undefined state. And if the program is in an undefined state, then you can't reasonably hope anymore that things will keep working as they are supposed to work. So now other assertions may fail. API calls may fail because you send wrong parameters. You know, things may go south from then onwards. And so what you always want to focus on is the first time you saw something going wrong. You don't want to distract anyone um, sending reports about just follow up, er follow on errors, which are really not the core of the problem. So that's. Do you have code though that tries to remedy the problem in some way? Do we have code that remedies the problem? Only in, a, in very limited uh, ways. I mean, um, so for example, um, we have a switch no default, um, which switches on on the on a on a list of items, but it, there's no default, right? So you're you're just that that that's that would be an assertion. Um, then we just pick one, just pick a case, the first one, whatever. Um, just not don't pick like nothing, right? Now that's probably bad. It's more likely to be bad than just picking something. Um, if we have an error handler for an API function, an API function is already expected to fail in some way. We use the same error handler if it fails in a different way, hoping that the error handler is going to be generic enough, which is a, probably a valid assumption. It's going to be gen generic enough to, to deal with that other error as well, even if we don't expect that error. And, and this is one of the cases where we are very aggressive. We only put in the errors that we actually have seen and that we have a good explanation for. Um, and the other ones that are often collected in the field. Or, or it's like, yeah, OK, oh, yeah, I forgot. This one error can also occur. And then you just add it. And, and, and that, that's basically it. Anyone else? If not, then thank you very much. And uh, thanks for coming. <laughs>